Chicago.com. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Good morning, Dan and Amy. Amy, you know how uh, uh, Megan Kelly, like, interned for you, and then she, like, shot past you long ago and kind of left you in it's the okay. dust and doesn't oh, even no, talk no, to you anymore? No. That's not true. She was recently at NBC and, and touted my excellence as a as a tutor, as a, as a teacher, I yeah. should say. Yes. I mean, you know, the occasional pander. That's not Oh, that's the not same true. Thing She's as, a lovely woman. Yeah. Let's not get ugly. So, as I was saying, so, you yes. know. So, you so know, I have you Megan and is. Savannah Guthrie. What do you have? Right, so so right, so you kind of, you know, I wouldn't really. You can't Paula really take. Ferris, you can't Ginger take credit Z. for them. Well, no, because I, I help help them hone their skills. Right, and then they, you know, far they went far surpass you. Leapfrog. Yeah. Well, I, I had that happen too. Um, so back in two thousand two, I'm running a Republican candidate's um, race for governor, mm-hmm. and uh, a young woman named Erica Harold uh, interned. She's from Champaign. She interned on the campaign. And then, you know, she a couple of a year later, she won Miss America. And then, you know, basically she doesn't even deign to talk to him anymore. And I don't blame her. You helped her with the talent competition, right? She, well. Kind and, of. And the gown. Uh, I helped with the swimsuit. <laughs> and now, you know, so she went on to do all these amazing, uh, Miss America, Harvard Law School, mm. you know, be a, be a lawyer. And um, she's so run, she run for office. To you. Oh, yeah. I mean, long ago, like I said. So, I mean, I know the pain. Uh-huh. Of you know being completely eclipsed by someone once uh, <laughs> under your mentorship, you know what I mean. Uh, and uh, now Erica Harold is uh, trying to end the reign of one of the Madigans, the, the Lisa one, the one who's been Attorney General since uh, 2000, since she was elected in 2002. And uh, so uh, some good news in Illinois. The battle has been joined at least for the Attorney General spot. And for more on this race and why. Miss America Erica Harold, Harvard Law grad Erica Harold, has decided to make the race. We're going to ask her. Erica, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Good morning. And don't be so hard on yourself. No, I appreciate it. That's what I'm saying. You know, you get the occasional (laughs) pander. But I I, I appreciate that. Um, No, so, Erica, uh, why did you decide to uh, leave your law practice and run for Illinois Attorney General? I decided to run for attorney general because I think that the people of the state deserve an attorney general who will be independent, who will hold both parties accountable, and who will use the tools of the office to combat public corruption. And our current attorney general has not done that. When she ran for office nearly 15 years ago, she promised to aggressively combat public corruption, but she has stood on the sidelines when there have been patronage hiring scandals. And I think the people of our state deserve better. What do you think the biggest mistake, though, that she's made so far? Lisa Madigan. Oh, boy. Well, I mean, there's a lot. There's been the (laughs) issue of not addressing public corruption, uh, specifically when her father was involved back with the Metro patronage hiring scandal, the IDOT patronage hiring scandal. She had tools of office to address that and chose not to do so. And when you look at the concentration of family power in two statewide offices, that's problematic. When she decided not to run for governor in 2013, she cited that family conflict as the reason for doing so. She said that it would not serve the people of Illinois' interests if both the attorney general, or both the governor and the speaker were from the same family. When you have the office of attorney general that's supposed to be a watchdog, that creates an even greater conflict of interest. Yeah, but I mean, to be fair, before she was attorney general, she only had her law degree for like five minutes. So maybe she just doesn't <laughs> even understand the, uh, the, the job and uh, you know the criminal statutes under which she could prosecute public corruption. I guess. I think she's a formidable person and a good attorney, and therefore the fact that she's not using those tools of office makes the public wonder why is it that there are one set of rules for the regular people and then another set of rules for the politicians. Now, one of the questions that will be put to you that was put to her when she was running in the primary way back in 2002, I remember because I'm old, uh, (laughs) she ran against John Schmidt. Who oh, was like n- number shit. three at justice, or maybe he was number two at justice under Clinton. I mean, this is a guy who was like a career prosecutor, and she never prosecuted right. anything and still hasn't, as Erica's recounting. Um, but uh, sh- she was not a prosecutor. You're talking about public corruption. Um, you don't have a background as a criminal prosecutor, so how do you address that? 
Well, there are a host of, of, of issues that the Attorney General is supposed to address. Part of it's public corruption. Another large part of it deals with litigation experience, and I have a strong background in litigation. The other is to bring issues that are innovative in terms of addressing criminal justice issues in Illinois. And for the past 10 years, I've served on the National Board of Directors of Prison Fellowship, which is the largest outreach to inmates and their families, and is one of the leaders of bipartisan criminal justice reform efforts in this in the country. And so that's a background that gives me a unique opportunity to advance some innovative ways of addressing recidivism and crime and violence here in Illinois. And that's an issue where I can be a leader and she is not. All right. So on Monday, a little birdie has told us that uh, Governor Bonner is going to be signing uh, Illinois, uh, the bill to make Illinois a sanctuary state. And when that you, little birdie, by the way, the Chicago Tribune. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah. it's kind of a big birdie, <laughs> kind of a big birdie. But, you know, there's, there's rumblings. Um, and what would you do as attorney general? And what can you do as attorney general to stop that or try and prevent that from happening? When you're the attorney general, your job is to enforce the law. So regardless of your opinion on particular bills and particular pieces of legislation, if you're the attorney general and someone challenges the law, it's your constitutional responsibility to defend that law in court. And so I would take very seriously upholding the rule of law, and I wouldn't make my determination based on my own views on it. I would say, what does the Constitution say? What does the bill or the piece of legislation say? And then I would handle my constitutional responsibilities accordingly. I want to go back to uh, the prison fellowship uh, experience. Um, And by the way, that gives me a chance to plug. Next week, we're doing Criminal Justice Week here. We've got oh, uh, we've got document Excellent. we've got oh, documentarians we we've got law professors uh, we've got authors and criminologists from a range of opinions so this is going to be really interesting because this is uh, a real um, uh, topic that has been under addressed and and it, but particularly in Illinois where we have overcrowded prisons not unlike some other states and and just in terms of you know the bully pulpit of the attorney general's office as well as being a leader on reforms that have to do with criminal justice and our justice system more generally. Um, to speak to a little bit about your experience and how it could be applied to think about things like sentencing reform, uh, alternative sentencing, those type of topics that are much bandied about now, but um, we've seen some progress, but sort of marginal in Illinois. Absolutely. And it's, and it's a topic where both parties have the ability to collaborate and You don't see much of that happening here in the state, and so it's a great opportunity for that. But my own background is both focusing on a policy perspective, but actually going into prisons themselves and actually speaking to people whose lives have been affected by crime and addiction. And I think it's the going into prison part, first and foremost, that gave me a renewed sense of empathy and understanding for what is broken within our system. And that was... I started going into prisons when I back in 2004. I've been on death row talking to inmates, going from place to place within the prison talking to people about their stories and looking at the specific ways in which people's lives have been affected, particularly once they're released and want the opportunity to put their life back in order and contribute to their community, got me thinking about what can we do specifically to address these issues. One issue, as you raised, is addressing sentencing. When you're dealing with nonviolent, low-level offenses, continuing to incarcerate people both takes, takes away their ability to earn a living, it puts them in a prison system that's broken, and then makes it more difficult for them to get a job once they're released. And so if we're talking about something that deals with addiction, our resources might be better spent helping people to get treatment than spending $22,000 a year to incarcerate them. Yeah, you, that, that must have been the most popular prison visit since Johnny Cash did Folsom Prison Blues. <laughs> uh, or Folsom Prison Blues at Folsom Prison, your, your, your uh, prison visits, I suspect. Well, I, I didn't know what to expect, and I, the first prison I visited was a maximum, maximum security men's prison in Louisiana. Mm. And... I had no idea how people would respond to me, but 
each inmate that I visited who was on death row thanked me for coming because they said it communicated to them that they had not been completely written off by society. They understood that they were going to have to serve their sentence, and they were many of them were awaiting execution, but they felt a sense of hope that they had not been completely written off. And I think that people deserve second chances if they're willing to put their life back in order. And when we're dealing with issues such as people finding new jobs, right now our law penalizes employers who would give ex-offenders an opportunity. And there are ways that the Attorney General's office can work with the legislature to try to, pr to, try to promote different ways of addressing the legal standards to give employers greater opportunities and incentives to give people a better chance. And that helps our entire community. It helps our entire state because when people are back working, contributing to their families, it improves how they feel about themselves and it improves their ability to support their families. All right, so are you looking forward to this fight against uh, Lisa Madigan? Are you going to have a debate with her and offer and what's that? What's so exciting about it is that people on both sides of the aisle are excited about this race. When she first ran for office, as Dan said, it was in 2002, and there have not been very competitive races since that point in time. And people are finally looking at the concentration of power within that family. I understand the Madigan family name has declined dramatically in the polls among the public. And this is a fight that people want to have because they're understanding how that concentration of family power is thwarting reforms, whether it's term limits, fair maps, and they're understanding that they want the opportunity to have a change and a break in the status quo. Uh, for those uh, who who don't know you aren't familiar with your total story uh, you come from a biracial family and so I wonder if you have any comment on you know the state of uh, race relations tension elevated uh, and in some cases incendiary rhetoric uh, going on both uh, in Chicago and the nation generally it's really heartbreaking when you look and see what's happening in our country right now I think in Charlottesville it was horrifying to see white supremacists with torches doing what they were doing and to see the racial tensions that have been kind of exploited in our country during this past week. And you know, as a person of faith, I'm certainly praying for our country and certainly praying that we can start to find some sense of unity because we have very serious issues to address in this country. And continuing to fight each other is certainly not going to help us move forward. She is Erica Harold, uh, Miss America 2003. Uh, U of I, what, what class were you, U of I? 2001. 2001. A proud ILL INI person. Oh, there you go. There you go. That's how you know you went to Illinois right there. Uh, Harvard Law grad, uh, attorney, now candidate for Illinois Attorney General against Lisa Madigan. Erica, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And she joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Listen to podcast.